Hello, my name is Sean Thomas Radcliffe. Welcome to this episode of Preservation Oaks. In this series, we introduce you to yet another extraordinary organization serving their community by conserving and preserving our heritage. It could be an organization in your community, in your county, or in your state. Now sit back and relax and enjoy the program. Hello and welcome to another episode of Preservation Oaks on MicroStream Radio. On Preservation Oaks, we interview professionals from genealogical and historical societies across the United States. We believe citizens want to have a better understanding of these organizations, how they're funded, how each is unique to the communities they serve, what programs and events they currently have underway, what services they offer to the public, whether the people they work with are members or potential members, whether they live in the local communities or are located somewhere else in the country. And finally, we believe this information is interesting and vital for people to understand how important it is to join, support, volunteer with, and donate to one or more of these core societies. Today we are chatting with Sandra Bengston, the president of the Fremont County Historical Society located in Sydney, Iowa. Here's a brief bio for Sandra. Sandra Bengston lives in Sydney, Iowa and has professionally completed genealogical research since 2012. She has performed research for historians, authors, and corporations seeking the heirs related to estates. She mainly specializes in research and retrieval of documents at the Fremont County Courthouse, but will also research at Page County, Iowa, Mills County, Iowa, and Oto County, Nebraska. Welcome to Preservation Oaks, Sandra. How's life treating you? Just great. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for joining. How long have you been president of the society, Sandra? I have served as the president um, since 2014. I actually just joined, was asked to join their board just a year before that. I was asked to be on their board to, to take care of their genealogy research requests that came through the museum because some of the members knew I had started researching for individuals. I want you to know, Sandra, I went to Google Satellite View and went through the towns in Fremont County. And when I saw your society, your museum next, right on the corner of that block, and the town buildings in Sydney, all I really wanted to do was hop on a plane and come for a visit. <laughs> it, it's a very attractive little town. Several years ago, we did a three-year streetscape project, which has really, really spruced up the town quite a bit. Yeah, your area and especially your society and museum look really inviting. I see the sign on your main society building that says Fremont County Historical Society, And in smaller letters underneath, it reads Championship Rodeo Museum. What's that all about? Yes, um, the name of our museum is the the Fremont County History Center, Iowa's Championship Rodeo Museum. Our museum is a combination of Fremont County's history and the rodeo history. This summer, we we had our 98th rodeo. And so in two years, in 2023, will be the 100th anniversary of Iowa's Championship Rodeo, which is held in Sydney. And how this all came about, prior to the rodeo's existence, the old soldiers' reunion was held every summer, which was a reunion of, of the Civil War veterans. And it drew large crowds because of all the various entertainment that came in for it. 
Well, in 1923, the reunion was about to be discontinued because there was few Civil War veterans remaining. When our local American Legion decided to continue the summer gathering and started holding a rodeo for the crowd's entertainment. Well, that is so cool. So that's why your town is known as Rodeo Town USA. We're really not sure when Sydney adopted the title a Rodeo Town USA. That question has come up before, and we've yet to find the answer in our research. <laughs> but now that I just found out yesterday that our Sydney newspaper archives just went active online, free to the public, so we may be able to find the answer to this question. Oh, now. that would be fantastic. It could be way older than 100 years, huh? Mm-hmm. So I know Fremont County is next to the Missouri River. I know it's a fact that there's a possibility when, when I've met with historical or genealogical societies that live next to a river, I've learned that it's always a possibility that the river will overflow every fall and spring. Has that flooding ever happened, and, and has it impacted the town of Sydney or, or your facilities? Mm-hmm. No, not, not the town of Sydney. The, the Nistabotna River is the closest to us. It's about three miles east out of town. But the, Sydney's elevation is high enough that if the river gets out of its banks, it's, it's not coming into Sydney. Oh, fantastic. If it does come into Sydney, um, the whole world's going to be in trouble, you know. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> my little joke, I always say we better see no one in the ark going by if, if the river gets into Sydney. Oh, thank um, goodness. But, However, our other towns in Fremont County, such as Bartlett, Purcell, and Hamburg, were greatly affected two years ago by the flood in 2019. That's too bad. And they were also affected by the flood we had in 2011. That's really a shame when that happens. I've never experienced uh, having my own home or any of that flooded, but I used to live in the Midwest in Illinois in a place called Dunlap, Illinois, which was right next to Peoria, Illinois. And we had river flooding every year and people would get out their canoes or their kayaks and go downtown and boat around downtown on, the, you know, where the streets used to be. And it was mm-hmm. kind of cool. Yeah, I just cannot imagine an experience something like that. They just, you know, usually if you, if you live in a flood zone, you don't, you don't have a basement or you don't keep things in the basement. And, right. and just a way, just having to prepare for that and loss of your personal property and everything yeah nasty plus what it leaves behind right mud and mm-hmm. mold and right. fish and god knows what else what's the deal with the large beautiful boots all over town and the boots on the light poles who's making those there's an organization in town known as the sydney hometown pride okay the, the hometown prides were organized in iowa about six years ago so they are nonprofits. And this group is eligible to receive grants for projects such as this. I'm, I'm not very involved with the organization, so I'm not sure who's making the boots, but I know that they are painted by our, our local art students in the schools. Oh, they're, they're really nice. Yes, we had just gotten, um, we got the boot just this summer for the museum's front, which is very appropriate. We were re- very happy to, to get it. Fantastic. I know Imogene is a pretty cool town. They have a focus each year on the Irish and St. Patrick's Day. They have a St. Patrick's Day, or at least I read they have a St. Patrick's Day festival, I guess. Then there's Shamrock Days and the Marathon in September each year. Um, Does the society have a role, or do do you have fundraising during those events? Well, um, not really, because, you know, even though Imogene is in Fremont County, it sits on the Page County line, so it's it's about one of the, you know, furthest towns from us. Yes, they do. They do have the Irish history that they are known for. The Catholic Church, the St. Patrick's Church, it it was established in Imogene in 1880. Okay. Because the town actually started like in 1879, but the current church of today was built in 1915. It replaced the former church, which which was had been destroyed by fire earlier that year. It is known for the the altar inside the church came from Italy. It's a very beautiful, you know, kind of breathtaking church on the inside and it does it does attract when visitors come to Fremont County, quite a few make calls over there and make an appointment to get in and see the church, especially those that are from the Catholic faith. 
yeah, it's beautiful. I just thought it was really cool. There's another really cool thing, too. I, I looked at a building that was on the corner of Illinois and Fillmore Streets, and it's, mm -hmm. it's a pretty cool building, the way it's constructed with dark bricks and then light bricks making sort of a checkerboard pattern. What do you know about that? Yes, we're always fortunate when we have some original buildings that are still here today. It's always sad when you see when you see them go. It is. This building, it was built in 1913 by a bank, which was the Fremont County Savings Bank. It served as, that building served as a bank until the 1930s. Okay. At that time, another bank in town that had a larger building went under due to the Depression. So the Fremont County Savings Bank moved to that location to have a bigger building. So, so then from the 1930s until the 1980s, it was a law office for quite a few attorneys in Sydney. And then since, the, since after the 1980s, it's just had various owners and purposes. Wow, it's a really cool building. Is your downtown have a historic district? Would that be part of it? Well, we do have a, you know, we do have a courthouse square, you know, because we are the county seat. Yeah. And so, you know, having the courthouse in the middle... And having all all the businesses that wrap around the square, you know, I guess the the history is just built right in the town, right there. <laughs> yeah, cool. Very cool. Can you uh, provide the audience with an overview of the communities you serve, sort of the diversity of your membership, the mission of your society? Well, the Fremont County Historical Society, we we are dedicated to preserving our past for the future generations. Even though the museum is located in Sydney, it contains exhibits and information that represents all of our towns in Fremont County. You know, and just mentioning the ones, you know, there's many towns that used to be that we cover the history of them too. Yeah. But just mentioning the towns that are in Fremont County today, we already talked about Imogene. There's Tabor, Randolph, Farragut, Riverton, Percival. And Thurman, I think okay. I, I think I hit them all. Uh, you know, like I said, and there's many towns that used to be, and there might be a few houses or something there today, but are not active towns anymore. Oh, that's too bad. So the society, when did it start? It was incorporated in in 1963, and you know, by individuals that saw the need to to preserve our past for um, future generations. Have you yourself always been interested in history, and, and what led you to this profession? You know, I have been, although I didn't realize I always had it in me. I, I grew up in the country, and so, you know, back then the, the kids didn't have the activities you have today. Your parents weren't going to run you to town all the time and yeah. spend money on gas, you know. So I would get on my bike, and I'd ride, ride around the country down to a, down to a, a country cemetery. And I would read the names on the stones and, and wonder who these people were and what their story was. And then, of course, as I rode past the abandoned homesteads, I would wonder about the people who built them, the families that lived there. And, you know, and being a genealogist isn't a profession that you plan. It's the passion and the desire to find information, yeah. either on your own family or helping others as I do, is what leads you to this. You know, I worked in a law office for many years, so I was familiar with the kinds of documents and filings in our Fremont County Courthouse. Okay. So about nine years ago, I started doing some lookups for individuals at the courthouse, you know, just to find them specific, maybe a birth record, a death, or a marriage. And that's when I realized I enjoyed helping people find information on their families and wanted to continue doing research. I know you've got to be, you know, a serious scholar in the history of your county, and helping people and getting donations of artifacts and curating those artifacts for the museum, that kind of thing. Along the way, have you run into any funny or interesting stories from your society's history? Yes, of course, we've got many, many, and, and you know, and just a couple, couple of things that I'll, I'll share. One thing I find fascinating is the connections that Fremont County had with Jesse James' gang. You know, you think about probably a lot of us enjoy watching the the documentaries on the outlaws and the gunslingers, you know, the famous ones for our country. And, of course, the James gangs were, were the only gang close to, to us here in the Midwest. 
their their home was Kearney, Missouri, which is only about two hours from us today by okay. car, of course. And then, of course, Jesse James was killed in St. Joe, Missouri, which is only an hour and a half away from us. Okay. So back in the James Gang time, Fremont County was like a great highway for cattle drives going east, wagon trains going west, and the James brothers going north out of home base in Missouri. You know, when you have that profession, there's you probably there's only so much you can do in your own area, so you have to travel, you know. Right. And so Jesse and Frank's travels into Fremont County resulted with several accounts of families' dealings with them. Years back, Fremont County residents turned in their grandparents' writings to us, and we published all of them in a, a book that we did in 1996, which was called Thumbprints in Time. Oh, that's cool. And one, uh, just one of the little interesting stories I'll mention, the James Gang was known to have robbed the bank in Imogene in I, the late 1870s. I think it was actually, it was either 1878 or 1879. And there is a story that they came by Frank Wright's farm near the alma mater school and the country school, of course. The little girls were out playing in the yard when the ga- James Gang came through the knee-high evergreens that was north of the house. They were looking for horses in the barn. They had just robbed a bank, and in Jesse's always well-laid plans, he, he had planned to pick up fresh horses on the White's farm. He had spotted the fancy team that Mrs. White always had hitched up ready to go, but she had driven them to Farragut that afternoon, okay. and he was unable to get the horses. And so he was heard cussing in disgust as they galloped away. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I guess still he didn't get caught. And another interesting interesting um, story or fact about Sydney right here, our museum has a guest register from a hotel that was one time known as the Cromwell House. Oh, cool. And actually, the, the house is still here today, but it was, like, moved in 1898, and a lot, and only part of it was moved. So, and it's actually in terrible disrepair. Repair. There's not really anything we can do with it, so it's probably going to come down. But in this guest register on Monday, May 9, 1870, the the name of U.S. Grant residing at D.C. USA is written in the register. Oh. Now, if President Grant named appeared alone, we would just admit it as someone playing a joke. But also signed in with him is Richard Yates of Illinois and Benjamin F. Butler of Massachusetts. Okay. And so they were both politicians who had a connection with Grant. And a couple of days later, Henry Clay Dean signs into the hotel. He wore many hats. He was actually from Dubuque, Iowa, but he was a politician, an orator, attorney, and a minister. So, you know, with this piece of history we have, there are no newspaper writings available or any person here today that can verify that President Grant was, in fact, here. Yeah. Nor there's any way to know for sure what his business was in Fremont County. Now, one theory is this political group was trying to organize the Greenback Party at that time. Grant had not been president for very long, but we did find in his memoirs in his Ohio library, they indicate he was taking a Western trip at that time. But the trip was kept quiet since he was a new president, and it hadn't been that many years after Lincoln's assassination. All right. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So they were starting a new political party. That That's our theory. That could be. You know, that was uh, some of that group tried to get the Greenback Party going, and that was about the time frame of it. Wow, that's very cool. And do you highlight it, that in your museum at all? We actually do have an, we have an exhibit. We have the, the book is in a, is in a lock lighted case. We also, because the, the house is now kind of in the process of being transferred to the city to be taken down. So the attorney involved there has allowed us to get quite a few things out of it for our exhibit. Like we've got some French doors. We have the stairway banister. And, oh, cool. and so we have a, and we've just done this this last year, made a really nice exhibit for the, the Cromwell house to, you know, to inform the public that we're just pretty sure President Grant slept here. Absolutely. <laughs> That's very cool. Uh, how did your um, members and the community react to that? You know, I I know when I, you know, I've been kind of reading things and with my interest. I, you know, I was like born and raised here, and I've, 
you know, just my interest in history. I've, I've read a lot of history counts, you know. Yeah. And the so the historical side, he had in their writings that his name was in the book. And then there was this question, could this be President Grant? So I so several years ago, I decided, well, I'm going to find this book, and I'm going to look into this and research it. And, and that's when I came up with the other facts that I just told you about. Yeah. And the story, little story, short story I wrote was published locally. And, you know, and then with the house, the condition of the house and knowing it have to come down, you know, that was one reason that was published. So people would know the history it held. So I do feel good about the fact. I know as I'm out in the public I, and that house comes up, I often hear, hear it said, it was a hotel, you know. Well, you know, President Grant stayed there. So I thought, well, if... if if nothing else, I have pre- preserved the history of that house. So Absolutely. People know, Absolutely. Know what the history that it holds. I hope you got some good pictures of the house since they're taking it down. That's too bad. We sure do. Yeah, we have. You know, we have older pictures. We also have have more recent photos. You know, and fantastic. So, now, I also read that Mormons settled there in your county at one time. They may still be there. I don't know. Uh, but what can you tell us about the that history? Well, the the Mormon Battalion was the only religious unit in our U.S. military history. They served from July of 1846 to July of 1847 during the Mexican-American War. Okay. So in July of 1846, a battalion of 550 young Mormon men, along with helpers that were herding the livestock, were marching down the Bluff Road from Council Bluffs, Iowa heading for the Mexican-American War. Now, that sounds to me like a pretty long walk, but (laughs) their cattle wandered into an area which would later become the town of Thurman. So when the women in the group found the animals, the animals had stopped in this grassy area with a creek and plum trees in bloom. So some of the women decided just to stay there and settled there while the battalion went on to the war. Okay. So the settlement was first called Plum Hollow, then later the town was was named Fremont City, but because of, I guess because of Nebraska, having Fremont, Nebraska, uh, you know, in close proximity to us, um, by 1889, they, they, named, um, they changed the name of the town to Thurman, and that is its name today. Wow, that's cool. Now, they eventually moved on, or they, they stayed in... No, the, and... um, the, the part of the Mormons that that dropped out of the battalion and and settled or waited for the husbands to come home, there um, there's descendants of those families in Thurman today. Okay, did we discuss the uh, history of the county? I don't think that we did. Just kind of like briefly here in a nutshell, Fremont County, Iowa, was formed in 1849. The county is named after John C. Fremont an explorer, military expert, and geographical scientist. Okay. Now, John Fremont did not actually have a connection with Fremont County, but the county was named after him because he was admired for his abilities and the part he played in opening up the West to settlement. Wow. You have another building close to your Historical Society home building, and it's called The Gathering Place. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really liked some of the ads. You had a Memorial Day dinner being served and a spaghetti dinner. And it, it's just like, okay, community, welcome here and come on in. Let's let's have a meal. What can you tell us about that building and how it serves the community? Well, the gathering place was actually built as a Baptist church in 1893. Oh, wow. It's old. And it was gifted to the Historical Society in 1966. And so then quite a few years after that, when our, when our current main museum building was built in 2011, we joined it to the gathering place so we can go between both of the buildings. And we use the gathering place for our, as you said, our mills, and we have our fundraising mills, other, our educational program, performing arts programs. We have held quite a few plays there. But it's also available to the public for, for rentals you know, for for events, you know, such as receptions, luncheons, or family get-togethers. Nice. Very nice. 
So as an old Baptist church, it, it certainly is well kept. It looks really beautiful. Yes. You know, I think it was, as I said, we don't it since 1966. It was oh, about the 90s, 2000. You know, it was kind of looking in disrepair. And yeah. so around 2005, it was, and of course, that's before I was at the time I was involved, but it was, it was renovated, you know, the, the inside fixed, you know, and the outside. And I don't know what, at point they took the pews out of it, but, you know, of course, made it so, you know, a play could be there and people could be seated either with chair seating or else tables if it's a dinner. All right. And when that all happened about 2005, it was, it was spruced up really nicely and to what it looks like today. Now, you said the uh, Historical Society itself started in the 1960s. Is that museum a new building? Yes. Even though the, the Fremont County Historical Society was incorporated in 1963, they actually did not have a building until, I think, like 1971. Oh. In about 2010, that, that building was having some problems, and there was, and it was questioned if it was going to be safe for the public because of those problems. And... So we built, the current facility we have um, was built in 2011. Because of the problems with our old building, we had items in storage and we didn't really, we couldn't really function for about four years until about 2014. Because it took us that long to finish up the inside, you know, continue raising funds and be able to start operating in it when we did in May of 2014. Very cool. I'm certainly hoping that the community knows, since they showed the support for the building and that kind of thing, they know how valuable it is to have that kind of a facility. Do they continue to support the building and that? Moving the society forward, I guess, is what I want to ask. Well, yes. The the, the income we get from Randall's there is very helpful. Yeah. Now, just last year, we were able to put a new roof on the building, which is a you know, a major expense when you're talking about a building that height and the steep roof. But through a a couple of grants by our local um, Fremont County Endowment Organization and generous donations from, you know, members, we, we we got the new roof on to assure that the building would be preserved, you know, for quite a few more years. Oh, that's great. What can you tell the audience about the history of the local street names? I noticed some like Clay and Cass and Webster. Are these all historical figures of the past, or how did the streets get those names? Well, a couple of the streets I know were were named after, you know, former citizens. Some of the names, I think, actually, you just find those street names in every town for some reason. But the streets that were named after early citizens were the original landowners, and when when the town was divided, the subdivisions were named after them, too. Okay. Such as one individual, Hiram Fletcher, owned quite a bit of land on the north edge of town. So besides Fletcher Street, part of that development is Fletcher's addition. And then another early landowner was Merrill Webster. He was elected the Fremont County Treasurer in 1881 and held the position for three terms. He wrote three sets of abstract books for the county and was an abstractor at the time of his death. His sons took over the abstract title business then after his death. So an abstractor is someone who puts value to property? Is that true? An abstractor, an abstract title, which, you know, I think Iowa is probably the only state in the United States that still uses them. (laughs) The, The abstract title is a record of the title, a history of the property. Oh, so oh, okay. the abstractor will go to the courthouse and record these entries and type them into a document for the history of the land. Like you'll have your original land patent when the U.S. you know sold sold the first city lots or to somebody, and then it. And then they sold it to the next person and and so forth, you know. So it's sort of the provenance of the place. Right. I mean, it's the abstract title does not tell you anything about when a house was built or when a building was built. Right. It's just simply the 
the record of the land oh, as it, cool. the chain of title as it passed through owner, ownership. I wonder why everybody doesn't do that. That sounds like a great system for keeping track of the history of each place. Well, I tell you, they're very, I mean, especially if you live in a town as I do and you're familiar with the names and, and who the what the people did in your town, they're very interesting to read through. And and I think at one time, probably most of this, way back in this time period of when Mr. Webster was doing it in 1899, I think all the states in the U.S. did. But eventually most states got to just doing the title insurance rather than going through the work of creating that abstract title document. That's very cool. Do you do any work with the school children in the area to teach them about, you know, they, as a child, you know, you go through riding your bike or whatever and you're always riding up and down Fletcher Street but you don't know the history of that that street do you do any of mm-hmm. that yeah well we do um we do partner with the all the elementary schools in Fremont County every year we have the children of course last year things got canceled due to, yeah. due to the COVID but the the school children come once a year and they're given a tour of the museum and actually, about three of my members are retired school teachers, so it's just a perfect job to have them do. And so they're given a tour of the museum, and then they're also, we take the children in to see the little country schoolhouse. Oh, nice. So they can see what it was like to have, what it would be like when you had school in a one-room school. And we've also have provided digital history files to the schools for the, to aid the teachers with their lessons. Fantastic. I know when I was coming up and a you know, child, there wasn't a kindergarten at that time. And the first school I attended was a two room school with a coat rack in the middle and a stove to heat it. So I always feel like, you know, I was pretty lucky to get sort of on the tail end of those one room schoolhouses. Right. I think they were active here until like the about the late 1950s. And then the, the last of them went out. Yep. I know railroads, or at least I read that railroads play, played a big part in the founding of your county and, and the town of Sydney. Is there still rail traffic coming through the town? No. Sydney had a railroad once upon a time, as all of the towns did. But our last train came through in 1966. Wow. And also, even though our railroad, it was established in 1879, but we did not get a straight through connecting route. Our railroad line went between Sydney and Hastings, Iowa, so the branch was only about 21 miles long. Wow. So how do you get agriculture products uh, just by truck? Yes, I mean just just shipping by truck. Uh Yeah, okay. Uh, Speaking of railroads, I think there was an underground uh, railroad, some activity of that in Tabor, which is in Fremont County. What can you tell us about the underground railroad? Yes, the town of Tabor is known for their Underground Railroad history, and they have their own historical society, and they also own the Todd House, and they're also known for a college that was once there. Now, now I can't do justice to the story as the, the people at the Tabor Historical Society could, but to summarize their history, uh, the town was settled in 1852 by George B. Gaston, and Reverend John Todd, okay. who moved to Tabor from the Civil Bend settlement. Now, Civil Bend was west of the town of Percival in Fremont County, and the settlement was close or pretty much right on the Missouri River. So when they found that the river was creating problems, they looked for higher ground. Now, this group originally came from Oberlin, Ohio, with the intentions of starting a Christian college okay. and a Christian church. So Reverend Todd and his group started the Congregational Church, the Tabor College, and helped escape, um, helped the escaped slaves from Nebraska travel to freedom. And I might mention, too, that, you know, Fremont County and the Civil Bend Settlement, we were involved with a well-known famous case pertaining to two slave girls that belonged to Stephen Knuckles okay. of Nebraska City. Now, this happened in 1858. Stephen Knuckles was a prominent businessman, but when his two slaves escaped to cross the River to Freedom, Knuckles and his men went after them, causing injury to the residents of the houses searched and property damage. Oh, wow. 
this resulted in lawsuits and charges against Knuckles. So he did have to pay, uh, can't remember the figures, he had to pay a pretty hefty fine for back in the day. However, Knuckles is still has a reputation of being a respectable businessman once upon a time in Nebraska City, and a park is named after him there. <laughs> wow. Wow. What a time that must have been. As a person, I can't imagine, first of all, being property, and second of all, having someone hot on your trail and other people are helping you to escape. I'm really glad you have that history. It, it's great. I hope that you have some kind of exhibit showing how the county was involved in the Underground Railroad. We do. In our Civil War exhibit, we have a wall on the Tabor History and Underground Railroad. The members from the Tabor Historical Society, they did set up the exhibit for us. And actually, one of their board members is on our board, too. So we try to, I mean, we're only 10 miles apart. We try to work together and, and partner together as much as possible. Sandra, I hate to interrupt, but I'm going to have to take our first break. Okay. And so listeners, I'm here with Sandra Bankston, the president of the Fremont County Historical Society, and it's time for our first break. You're listening to Preservation Oaks on MicroStream Radio. If you enjoy the show, then please tell all your friends, family, neighbors, pals, business associates, colleagues, and just maybe a couple of enemies about the show. And if you'll do that for us, Then we'll make sure we create even more episodes at www.preservationoaks.podbean.com. We thank you so much for spreading the love. We'll be right back to Preservation Oaks with Sean Thomas Radcliffe after these important messages. Hello mates, I hope you're doing well and enjoying the program. Your support is a direct and vital investment in the programs that MicroStream Radio provides throughout the year. Whatever programs you enjoy remain alive and on the air thanks to contributions from generous donors like you. A contribution of any amount makes you a member. Please take a few moments and show your support today at www.patreon.com backslash MicroStream Radio. Your support allows us to bring you more unique and increasingly valuable programs. We thank you so much. This is Carrie Eilers from the Cedar Falls Historical Society, and I love listening to Preservation Oaks on MicroStream Radio. Buckle up for safety, buckle up. Buckle up for safety, always buckle up. Pull your seatbelt snug, give an extra tug. Buckle up for safety, buckle up. Buckle up for safety, buckle up. Buckle up for safety, always buckle up. The National Safety Council says if you don't have seatbelts, get them. If you do have seatbelts, use them. Hola. Si es nuevo en los Estados Unidos o es de ascendencia hispana, querrá ser voluntario y apoyar a su sociedad histórica o genealógica local. ¿Por qué? Porque ahora eres parte del tejido de Estados Unidos, y estas sociedades quieren ayudar a contar tu historia familiar y tu historia. Si desea que su cultura se conserve como parte de nuestra historia estadounidense, eche un vistazo a su área y conéctese con su sociedad local. Estarás contento de haberlo hecho. Gracias. Please stay on the line. We will be with you shortly. Non-emergency, how can I help you? I'm kind of worried. I think my wife is missing. When did you last see her? About an hour ago. An hour ago, huh? Well, let's see what today is. Ah, yes. It's been two weeks. Um, does she have a cell phone, sir? Have you tried to call her? Yep, 
It goes straight to voicemail. I've been trying for almost an hour. Okay, what's her favorite room in the house, sir? I'd say the bedroom. Have you looked in the bedroom, sir? Uh, no. She's probably listening to Preservation Oaks. Preservation Oaks now, really? You can listen to Preservation Oaks anytime by going to preservationoaks.podbean.com. Go check your bedroom, sir. I'll stay on the phone. Okay. This episode is so cool. Come listen. Hello. You still here? I'm still here. Yep. Found her. She's in there listening to Preservation Oaks. Boy thanks a lot. She really loves Preservation Oaks. Of course she does. Every two weeks we get to hear great information from a different genealogical or historical society and we get these types of calls. Tell her I totally understand. I love the program myself sir. Okay, will do. Hey, it's a new episode. I'm going in with her to listen. Sir, I'm hanging up now, sir. This is Anna. You're listening to Sean Thomas Radcliffe and Preservation Oaks. And now for a bit of selfless promotion. Hey dudes, I hope you're doing well and enjoying the program. Please consider supporting MicroStream Radio. We can't do it without you. We rely solely on the generous financial support of individuals from all across the world to power programs which enrich lives, inspire minds, and celebrate diverse perspectives. A contribution of any amount makes you a member. Show your support today at www.patreon.com backslash microstreamradio. Your support allows us to bring you more unique and interesting content. We thank you so much. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. Welcome back to Preservation Oaks. I'm your host, Sean Thomas Radcliffe. Our guest today is Sandra Bankston, the president of the Fremont County Historical Society. Welcome back. Thank you. Great to be back. We were talking about the Underground Railroad, and I think we just finished that discussion. Uh, So I want to go into funding. You know, everybody today with COVID and, you know, the impact it's had um, is squeezed for funding. Uh, What are your funding goals and what's next for the society? Well, we are an, an Iowa nonprofit corporation, and so we we solely operate on member dues, donations, and grants, and all kinds of other little things to raise funds. We we sell books and souvenir type items in our gift shop, and and then hold um, some dinners and programs and some regular fundraising activities. Basically, about one third of our income comes from our member dues and donations. Another third is the, the activities and fundraising. And then the last third is the grants that we are fortunate to be able to get the ones that, you know, sometimes you write a grant and you don't always get it, but sometimes we're fortunate and we do. Yep. You know, our first concern is just our, um, our month-to-month funds that take care of our normal expenses, you know, just such as the utilities, the insurance, and the facility upkeep. And this is where our our dues, I mean, play the part in and the extra donations and getting us through this. But you know, but then extra funds are needed for work and growth of the museum. We have many ideas, you know, from you know even smaller needs to to larger ones. And you know, like a smaller need is we we need to um, put some additional concrete in the front of our building right. so we can have some off street parking. We do not have our off street parking at this time. Then a bigger idea, we'd like to build a gazebo um, that could be used for our events during nice weather and also used by the public. So that's just, uh, um, I mean, there's the list goes on and on of things that we probably need or we want. But yep, that's just of an example of a couple. <laughs> well, that's great. What type of fundraising activities do you get involved in? I know there must be a state fair or, 
you know, these um, festivals that we talked about in Imogene, there's probably some others. Do you get involved in all those? The biggest fundraiser we have is in connection with the, the rodeo that's held in Sydney. Oh, right. The rodeo board allows the Fremont County Historical Society to do a 50-50 raffle every evening, the five performances every evening. With the 50-50 raffle, you know, it's a cash raffle. So if $1,000 come in one night, the Historical Society, as a nonprofit, gets $500, and the person that wins the raffle gets the other 500 Oh, that's cool. So, you know, we are we are a small county. We're a county of about 7,000. Oh, okay. I mean, and so we we can usually make around 5000 off that. So that is, that's a big amount for us. Yeah. That's and, nice. you know, and as I talked about, there's usually a couple of three dinners a year that we will, oftentimes we don't set a price for dinner, but we just ask for a, ask for a free will donation because people tend to be more generous when you're just asking for a donation yeah. versus making them pay a certain price. And, and, but, you know, we, even though we do, we do have to fundraise to, to survive. We do many things that we do not charge for. We try to give back to the community all we can. As I already mentioned, what we do for the schools, of course, that's, that's just giving back to the community. Yep. And I probably also hold at least, at least three open houses a year where um, people can just come in without asking for any admission fee. And anytime we do have a dinner or program in the gathering place, the museum is always open for them to walk through as just part of, you know, what they've already donated for their dinner. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. So you get a lot of support from the community? Yes. Fremont County gives us a, gives us a certain amount every year. Oh, cool. Um, we greatly appreciate it. We couldn't survive without it. But, I mean, it's not it's not a huge amount that right. like, funds us, like, the entire year. We um, we offer yearly our our dues our yearly memberships. Mm-hmm. They're for either individuals, couples, families, or businesses. So these are the main things that you know. And, and as I said, what grants we can get, we do get a fee because we're the trustee for the the Farrell House Museum in Randolph, which we haven't talked about that yet. Yeah. But we do get a fee for that. So it's just kind of every little bit we can bring in just to keep our head above water but we've been doing pretty good so we're pleased on your website do you do can people buy books do you get anything from you mentioned a book earlier um do you sell those yes um we do have we have books available in our gift shop for sale through our website people can also they can also order a book on the website if it's not one that's listed they can email us and and request what they would like. And they can also, you know, even become members, pay dues, and, and make donations through our PayPal button on the website. Well, that's fantastic. Um, what types of more specialized certificates do you have? Any of those going on, like uh, like pioneer certificates or any of that kind of thing? About the only thing along that line that we have done, and we've done this for, for many years, we we in, encourage individuals to share their their family photos and histories with us. Right. So for a small donation, we, we will take that information and we design it into a family history frame for them. Oh, that's and cool. And then we hang it, what would we call our pioneer families, we hang it in our hallway that goes to our genealogy library, and it's very, it's very impressive looking. That sounds great. Wow. Yeah. Um, If I had relatives there in Sydney, I would definitely take advantage of that. A more difficult question, how is COVID or how has COVID affected your society and more importantly, your county? Last year with COVID, we we normally, our museum is open regular hours, um, the 1st of April through the end of October. Because the... um, you know, the state of Iowa, the, the Iowa governor had closed down museums until late in May. We weren't able to open until like the 1st of June. And then there was about, there was about three dinners that we had planned that we, we had to cancel because of COVID. And I think I did the math and I figured out that probably because of COVID, we had lost, uh, last year we had lost about $5,000, which doesn't sound like much, but that's, a huge chunk for an organization oh, yeah. our size. But luckily, 
you know, members had been generous, you know, with extra donations. And, and again, we, we've been able to keep our, our head above water somehow. Thank goodness. Has, um, has the town, have you lost businesses due to COVID? I don't believe that we have oh, um, that I know of. You know, I mean, of course, you know, our school was shut down for quite a time with the students doing online, you know, just online schooling, which from what I heard is very, very hard to do with the younger children, you know, especially. But now school is back in session and, you know, the COVID numbers have kind of started rising again this fall. Right, but right. Hopefully, hopefully it will resolve itself here in the near future, we yep, hope. We're hoping. Well, that's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that it hasn't hit you, your community very hard. Some communities have had businesses shut down and, you know, they've lost key people in the community due to COVID. Crossing my fingers, everything goes, uh, stays the way it is and, and goes well for you guys. And, you know, one, one thing I didn't mention relating to our fundraising, you might have seen the pictures of the museum that we have a, a courtyard of bricks out front. Oh, yeah. And these bricks are, are purchased, like, for $100. You can purchase a brick for yourself or your family member. Most of the bricks are for people who, who have passed away. And it honors our, our, volunteer, our founders and our volunteers. So um, your name goes on a brick in the front courtyard for $100. You turn in a picture of the person. You turn in a story that goes into a, a binder that's inside the museum for people to look through and read. So that's just a, another thing we do to bring in money to, to keep us operating. Well, plus it looks really good, and it shows community involvement, and it's, it's just a great thing. So what kind of outreach and education does the society, so you're involved in the rodeo, you're involved with school children, do you do any, oh, and you have dinners, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that the society does in the community in terms of outreach or education? Well, we usually, we usually hold at least one program, one or two program a year that are, are free to the public. And as I mentioned earlier, we always include an open house in the museum. For example, in 2017, there was a solar eclipse, yeah. and Fremont County, a corner of Fremont County, was the only area where it was going to be visible. Oh, cool. So we had a um, an eclipse expert, that um, a college professor, that came and talked about it, and we held this free program for the public, and we had a uh, hundred people show up, which that fills our gathering place. We also offered the Sydney Community School provided a bus that we could take take a group down to this site to to observe the eclipse, you know, because it was down near the near the it was on the river banks and not an area that everybody would just go drive to, you know. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And last year, right before COVID hit, we had an we had an underground railroad program uh, in February for Black History Month, and so our our board member that's from the Tabor Historical Society gave the program. We had a we had a documentary we showed and and also we when one of our Fremont County towns is is planning a celebration, you know, like maybe they're you know, it's time for them to have their hundred and fifty year celebration. Yeah. We we dig out our history and, and help them, you know, find find what they need. And, you know, and I think as I said earlier, many many of our yearly activities our fundraisers because we have to fundraise but yeah, yeah. but we enjoy being able to give back to our community whenever it's possible do you guys publish a newsletter yes we do we we put out a we put out a newsletter about three times a year oh that's great in the newsletter is that how you keep the con community informed or are there like if if the whole community comes in for you know sort of a spaghetti dinner do you guys give an update or how do you keep the community informed about the progress of the society in achieving the mission? Our newsletter just goes out to a mailing list I have, which is, is members and others. So probably our best, you know, we do put our upcoming activities, we put them on our website. Yeah. But probably our best, our best source of advertisement is our Facebook page. We put it on our Facebook page. We also, you know, around the square, we just take, flyers and post them in places where the businesses allow some community advertisement like that. Right. So yeah, basically the 
you know, the the posters, the the Facebook, and and sometimes and sometimes newspaper advertising. That's how we get our events out to everyone. Oh, that's great. So I know that there's the museum building, and then there's the gathering place. I I saw that there's a museum on the corner, and beyond that. What else do you have that the society manages? Well, we also have the, um, I did talk about the, you know, the country schoolhouse that is on our facility. Yeah. And I might mention that the country schoolhouse was donated to us in 1969 and was moved to our property then. It was originally um, called the Sunnyside School, and it was southwest of Sydney, on the Bluff Road near the Wabansi State Park. And it's a museum schoolhouse. It is furnished exactly as the students would have sat there and had school in, in 1893. Now we also, and I had mentioned briefly earlier, we also have the Farrell House Museum, which is in, in Randolph, which okay. is like 10 miles north and east of us. And the Farrell House was built to the Fremont County Historical Society in 1995, and we serve as the trustee for the Farrell House Trust. The Farrell House is, is a house that was built in 1871, and it contains 12 rooms okay. that portrays how the three families that lived in the house over the years lived. And the artifacts in the house are from the 1870s to about 1940s time period. Now, people, so you give tours of the house? Yes. Um, our, it's not open regular hours. They have about two open houses a year. But one of my members that lives in Randolph is a contact person. So when somebody wants a tour or wants to get in the house, I just have them call, call my um, Sherry in Randolph that, that gets them in there. Oh, fantastic. All right. So, it, so it's, it's open during certain hours or you need to call the society in order to tour? Um, you need to you need to call to to set up a tour unless okay. you unless you um, stop by one of the open houses. They just had an open house. They're usually Sunday afternoons. They just had an open house on October seventeenth. Oh, fantastic! Um, Twelve rooms. That's a big house. Wow. It is. Yes. <laughs> and I I understand that it's it's coming up on its one hundred and fifty year anniversary. Right. That's exactly, that's why they, that's why we had the open house on October 17th. Okay. It was to celebrate the house being 150 years old. Wow. That's, that's a, Mm -hmm. that's a long time. Now this schoolhouse was a schoolhouse. It was built in 1893. And then at some point after its life of service to the community, it sat there and someone thought it was a good idea, which it is to, to preserve it and move it. Uh, to the property owned by the society? Is that how it went? Yes, that, that's correct. Um, thankfully, they did. It was actually the, the Fremont County Farm Bureau women were the organization that, that I guess, put up the funds uh, so it could be moved. We're very fortunate we have it, and that was done because, yeah. you know, so many of those country schools, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, a kid in the country, you'd see you'd see a lot of the abandoned ones sitting on somebody's farm, and, and eventually they just would deteriorate, and today they're gone. So, yep. so if this hadn't been preserved and saved for us, it, it would be gone today. Absolutely. You preserved that. That's fantastic. I know I saw pictures online where it looked like it was very well kept, beautiful coat of paint. You know, everything was very nice with it. And volunteers did all that work? Oh, yes. Everything everything we do is is volunteer. You know, our um, our volunteers open the, which can be our volunteers, some are members and some are mon- non-members. They open the museum for regular hours. The painting of the schoolhouse, we did, we did get a grant from the Vogel Paint Company that paid for the paint. Oh, but, nice. you know, our, our members like painted it. So it's like, you know, like I said, we're an organization that we don't have, we don't have a payroll and everything's, everything's volunteer. Yep. Yep. And thankfully you have community members who know how important this is to preserve. Now, community members also donate artifacts. What kinds of artifacts and records has, 
has the Society received as a donation from the public? We have many items collected over the years that are displayed in our museum, such as we have a Victorian furniture that's displayed in a, a Victorian house model. Oh, nice. A, a traveling pantry, which was used in a covered wagon. And they are such they are such big items. I don't know how people used to haul these things around in a covered wagon. <laughs> we have a mammoth tusk that was, in 1975, was unearthed near Thurman, Iowa. Oh, wow. And other things, too numerous to mention, our, our genealogy library, I think that it's unique because we, we hold original records, which were rescued from the Fremont County Courthouse. Right. You know, not just an index of the record, as you find in many genealogy libraries, or sometimes even in the courthouse. That's what you're pulling as an index. In 19, about 1975, an early member began the process of indexing and organizing family history documents into a, a genealogy research library. This member also rescued original books and documents from our courthouse, which are going to be disposed of after they were scanned onto that awful microfilm. Right. So because of his efforts, we gained the original Fremont County probate files that start in 1855. Wow. We've got the county tax roll books, the court justice books, um, which are basically like a magistrate court, and the old age pension rolls. The probate files are our most valuable family history resource yeah. because they contain a list of heirs at the time of their death, real estate they owned, and, and in the older files, other items of interest to families, such as the final doctor p- bill and the funeral bill. Wow. But the, the tax rolls are especially valuable because they start in 1855. You can verify that someone lived in a certain town or township during the years in which census records are not available. Because even if they did not own real estate, they usually had to pay a personal property tax, and they're listed in there. I cannot even imagine that the county was thinking about throwing that stuff out without giving it to the Historical Society. Yeah, and well, just a couple of months ago, I um, just by accident, I rescued the original wills that go with our probate files. You know, like I said, we've had the probate files probably since the 1980s, but the wills were still on file at the clerk of court's office. And I went over there to research for one of the wills that go with our probate files. And, yeah. and I found them, I found them all in a box. So I asked the clerk about it and she goes, Oh, I said, well, can, can we have them since we have the original probate files? And she looked at the rules and she goes, Oh, sure. She goes, I didn't know you have the original probate files. And they were still there because the shredding truck hadn't shown up yet. Wow. Can it, <laughs> I wonder if you can bring something up before the county board and have some kind of resolution passed that say all old records go to the Historical Society for archiving. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you don't just happen to come across it. Who knows what's been thrown out that you didn't right. catch? Well, that that's a good idea. Um, you know, I should contact a county board member. This, the clerk of court action, office is actually under the state of Iowa. So probably your best bet there is just keeping keep in close communication with the clerk of court yep. that can see that that gets done. Wow. And, and, and the reason that the, the wills were going to be thrown away is because the, the Supreme Court had come down with an order that said, you know, not books, not, not the docket books, but anything in files that was over 80 years old they were to dispose of. Wow. But luckily, the rules said that they could dispose to a registered historical society. So so myself and another member carried four boxes of them out there. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. What a save. Congratulations on that. I Thank know you, you, yeah. you mentioned you have a lot of volunteers. What kind of things at the society do volunteers have opportunities to do? So if I wanted to volunteer... You know, would you have a list of 10 things that I could potentially do and I pick one, or how does that work? Oh, sure. We'd, um, I'd probably show you around and tell you what we got going and see what you're interested in. But right now, our biggest project, we've just taken on a, a huge project. Our probate files, which I talked about, you know, start in 1855, yep. and they go through 1931. Well, the paperwork is folded into the court envelope still 
that are in our filing cabinets that came from the courthouse. Okay. So we are unfolding all the documents to get them scanned ready. Wow. This is um, the State of Iowa Historical Society is working with us to coordinate this project for family search. So once the files are scanned, they will be available free to the public on the Family Search website. Oh, really? That is so cool. But oh, we that's have, great. I mean, we've just started on it. I've probably been able to pull about 10, 12 people to help, you know, on a, one workshop a week, and some of us work an extra day a week. And I think we're to about file number 400, and we got 30 some hundred files. So wow. it's, it's going to, we know it's going to take a little while. We know it's not going to happen in a couple of weeks, but we're, we're working our hard, hardest to, to get these online available to people for their family research because if you know like god forbid if something happened to our museum oh, you know yeah. if there was a loss this history would be lost forever yeah how hard is it to unfold them that were they written in pen and ink where it could flake off or is it difficult to do that it's very hard to um get them unfolded like i said right now we're we're still in the group that's the 1850s to 1880s so sometimes they took, they'd like take two batches of like 25 papers and fold them up together. Okay. And so they've been, you know, so seriously, they've been folded up for 150 years. The, um, I think because they've been in these envelopes away from the light, the, the paper is, they used heavier paper back then than we do today. The paper is intact, you know, for the most part and, and sturdy. Oh, good. And probably the worst part is, Many of the older files are all handwritten, and trying to read the, the handwritten documents can be quite a challenge. Oh, yeah. I've done that before many times, trying to read a will or, or a land purchase, and, and it's just really, really difficult sometimes. Right, and sometimes I find when I research in the courthouse, I am looking at the index, I've got to pull four books before I get the right book because you're thinking... This is J page 40. No. Well, maybe it's book L page 40. Oh, right. You know, you can't read. They made those fancy letters, and you can't read what letter it is. Oh, sometimes. yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and they, uh, you know, the ones I was reading recently were from 1705, and, of course, they made all their uh, S's like F's, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're like, okay, what is this word? Yeah. How, you mentioned that you interface with the Iowa State Historical Society and, of course, Family Search. Do you interface with other counties, regional societies? Do you exchange artifacts for museums? That kind of thing. We we haven't um, partnered in that way. I just think the, I guess I, I know myself personally, what I'm trying to keep going here, I haven't had time to, to, um, to um, try to, you know, cross that bridge, but, right. but yeah, we would definitely be willing to, to do that. You know, if someone approached us that, um, would knew how to go about it would help us out. Yeah. You mentioned a partnership with the Tabor Historical Society, and I wasn't sure if there were others in other counties that you have a relationship with and, you know, they have certain things that maybe you want to bring in your museum and swap artifacts and, you know, that kind of thing. Well, oftentimes, you know, of course, we have closest to us here, you know, we have the, you know, Mills Mills County is like probably about, you know, 20, the, or the Mills County Courthouse is about 25 miles from us. Okay. You know, we got the, the Montgomery County Courthouse in Red Oaks, about 45 miles, and then we have the Page County Courthouse in Clorinda. So every so often when we do have an item that pertains to them or, or pertains to anywhere, we, we forward it on to them if it's not if there's just no reason for us to have that that book or that certain document in our library if it makes more sense to to send it where it where it came from to its home you mentioned that the the historical society has published some books and they're available on the website what's your best selling book are you in the middle of trying to publish anything at the moment not at the moment the first book that the Historical Society published uh, back in about 1980, or the, the first one I guess I should say I know of, was the Fremont County, Iowa Cemetery Records. It is a resource, you know, of course it's only up to date to like 1980 or 82, but it's a resource that's still used today. 
I still get requests for the book, and I still like have it reprinted for people if they want a reprint of the book. But this book is also available on the Family Search re- website. So anyone that requests the book, I do let them know. You know, if they want a hard paper copy of the book, I, I get a reprint for them. But but they can go online and, and download it from Family Search. In 1996, we we published a book um, called thumbprints in time and it's a story about fremont county's history and many individuals submitted their family stories along with pictures so again it's it's a book a resource book that's used quite a bit today and i still get requests for it to be reprinted wow Uh, in 2011 we published a a pictorial history that gave a nice pictures and a brief little history on all the towns kind of including the towns that used to be. And then just in 2018, we published the View from the Attic um, book. It's a consolidation of, of short articles and stories of Fremont County's history. These stories were printed in our local, published in our local newspapers for maybe 20 years. I'm not sure how long. Wow. And so, you know, we discontinued doing the articles. The, pe- the, the main lady that started it, you know, she got up in years, wasn't able to do it anymore. And so we took these stories and, and put them into a book. And these are also available on our website. So if you go, you know, you go to our website, uh, you know, the FremontCountyHistorical.org and stick attic or something into the search, you'll, you'll bring up all the, all the stories. That, that sounds like book. a really cool book. I, I may get a copy of that myself. That really and, sounds good. Um, also, uh, one of the books, I think it's still showing up on our website, that our, our local member, Evelyn Berkby, she was an author. She was also a radio personality. Um, this was her last book that she wrote a couple, three years ago, and it was called Through a, Through a Country Town Cookbook. It was Part of it was a cookbook, but part of it was um, pictures about her coming to Sydney in 1934 and what it was like then and like i said elvin was one of our one of our longtime members yep. and and kept active as long as she could um sadly she just passed away earlier this year at the age of 101 oh my uh, sorry to hear that it's such a loss we got to take our second break now sandra sure so, listeners i'm here with sandra bangston the president of the fremont county historical society It's time for our second break, as we mentioned. We'll be right back after these important words. You're listening to Preservation Oaks with Sean Thomas Radcliffe. Hello listeners, I hope you're doing well and staying safe. Do you know? Individual members provide the foundation of support on which all of MicroStream Radio's success is built. Your generosity helps keep us on the air with great programs. We rely on listeners like you. If you listen to the great programs here on MicroStream Radio, now is the time to show your support. It's a smart investment. As our membership grows and revenues increase, more great programs come back to you. Please take just a few moments to become a member today by going to www.patreon.com backslash microstreamradio. A contribution of any amount makes you a member. We thank you so much for being here and for your support today. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. This is Catherine Maguire. I'm a friend of Sean Thomas's. We often discuss how difficult it is for some societies to complete research requests. Regardless of where you're from, 
or which historical or genealogical society you're working with on family research, proper etiquette is important. You don't want to appear to have been raised by wolves. It's a good idea to know some essential skills when working with these valuable societies. Using proper etiquette, will help you support the organization performing the sometimes grueling work to find information for you. Here's a few essential skills for you to know. Number 1, if you're communicating with a historical or genealogical society, and asking for their help in finding information about family members. Pay close attention to their policies and take cues from them. Number 2, many genealogical and historical societies do not have all their paper and photographic records digitized and online. Therefore, things are not fast and easy for them, unless they get lucky. Many times, the society relies on the skill and knowledge of volunteers. They often comb through filing cabinets, books, directories and newspapers to find information you're seeking and information that will be valuable to you. This can take hours, days, and sometimes weeks, depending on what you're requesting. Be aware of this effort. It is often invisible to you but quite real. Number 3, regardless of the official policies, which are generally very low cost. Whenever you make a request to a society please donate liberally to help cover the cost of the time it takes to complete the research, make copies, mail information to you, and so on. Number 4, if the society finds information that helps you, and from that, you know your family lived in the area, then good etiquette is to join and become a member, and then to donate regularly. You can always use Amazon Smile. Doing this causes automatic donations to flow to the society as you shop. As a member, you often receive discounts both on the books you may need, as well as additional research from the society. If you live in the area, it's a good idea to volunteer. That way, you can get to know the records and the history of the area. Having this knowledge will greatly improve the outcomes of your research. Number 5, whether the research is fruitful or not, always send a thank you note or card in the mail, and don't wait more than a day or two after research concludes. Address the society, and thank them for the work they did and the information they sent, or just for trying hard to find something of value for you. Then add another short, positive comment to show your appreciation. Your note may be brief but heartfelt. It's easy to have good manners. These basic rules are just common sense. Ta-ta for now my friends. At Preservation Oaks, we love history. Not dry boring dates and facts, but rather the stories of the past about the people who were there. We believe history is our cultural fabric. We are very grateful for our historical and genealogical society guests sharing history and information about their society, their current needs, and about what makes them unique. We believe citizens need to understand their history, how their societies function, how best to support them, the history they preserve, and the services provided to members and the public. We must preserve our history for future generations. We must share and educate the current crop of youngsters, and share with pride the history and progress of our cities, counties, and states. We must help people find their roots and culture from the past. If you're a historical or genealogical society listening to Preservation Oaks, and you'd like to be a guest on the program, please email preservationoaks at gmail.com. Again, that's preservationoaks at gmail.com. Listeners, thank you for listening. You can comment anytime about the show or send suggestions by emailing preservationoaks at gmail.com. Thank you. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. Welcome back to Preservation Oaks. We're here today with Sandra Bangston, the president of the Fremont County Historical Society. Welcome back, Sandra. Thank you. Glad to be back. I want to tell the audience the website of Fremont County Historical Society, the email, and the phone number. The website is fremontcountyhistorical.org. And the email to connect with the society is fremontcountyhistorical at gmail.com. And then the phone number is 712-374-3248. That all correct, Sandra? 
Yes, that's correct. Okay. I want to take us back to um, the Society's website. You mentioned a few things. I can buy my books. I can donate. What else can I do on the website? All, all of these stories written in the last 20, 30 years, short stories on Fremont County histories are on, are on our website. And, you know, and if you don't want to bring buy the view from the attic book, and, you know, and especially, like, say you're, maybe say your your ancestors lived in Randolph or yeah. they lived in Thurman, and that's what you're interested in reading. So you can just, our re- website is searchable, so you can just stick in there, you know, what you want to, what you want to tr- search. And then, as you mentioned, we have the membership form on there for memberships and and ordering books and, and even requesting a genealogy um, search if you if your ancestors had connections in here, Fremont County, and you want to see if we have have a probate file or or bios or obituaries or anything to help you out with your family research. Fantastic. I know I was reading some of those stories. They're really good. You mentioned people can donate from the website um, using a button. Is that the easiest way for people? Do you want them to call or do you want them to go to the website? They can do whatever they like. The The PayPal button on there, they can choose what they want to donate. If they're donating it for a specific purpose, like genealogy research or something, they can indicate on there. Being a historical society, the majority of our of our patrons are are older. So I still have a lot of contacts who do not like to use the cards for yeah. payment or yeah. cards online. So checks can always be written and dropped in the mail. So like I said, um, cash, check, card, we'll, we will take any. <laughs> right. You mentioned a couple of current initiatives that you have going. Can you re- repeat or reiterate those uh, so that people know about any current initiatives or, or especially any current needs of the society that you want people of your area to know about and support? We Just this year, we, we've accomplished getting the Sydney Newspaper Archive digitized. This is, had, was made possible through a grant from the State of Iowa Historical Society, along with generous donations from our members or from individuals who, who had ancestors in Fremont County that they w- liked the idea of being able to bring up the newspapers and research. Yeah. And very exciting. I just found out, I mean, I know the company has had been doing processing and assessing them doing the work. I just found out late yesterday afternoon that I got the link that has gone a- active. Oh, cool. I haven't even had time to go on the link and play with it yet. <laughs> and so, and, it, and I'm getting ready to email out my contact list of everybody that was asked for donations with the link to let them know it's it's up and going right now. So I I never, you know, I I guess I just never thought in my lifetime that I would see our area newspapers available online and especially free to the public yeah you know i i subscribe to a couple of different newspaper archives because of my because of my research i i need them yeah but this is something the community history archive is something that anyone can go to from their home computer a library computer and it's free there's no charge yeah it's such a blessing those things i don't know how they do it how they take an entire newspaper and i can put in a keyword and that technology will find all of those keywords in that newspaper and I can then zoom in and and read whatever the article is. I I just think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to change your keyboard keyword because it's just bringing up too many other things (laughs) related to that too. But, but yeah, it does save. And you and I talked about that. You've been there, done that. It saves, it saves going through three or four years of things oh, looking yeah. for one certain specific item. <laughs> That's an amazing technology. Just saved a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of pain. What's your um, thoughts about how best to keep history and community support flourishing for the current generations? Well, we somehow, we, we need to attempt to get the younger generation interested and involved in their local history, in their local historical society. Yep. I mean, in my organization, the youngest people involved are, it's very sad, the youngest people involved are probably in their 50s, Mm -hmm. and the main ones that are active are in their 50s and 60s. So this really creates a problem as members age and develop health problems. In today's world, the younger generation is so busy that 
they're raising kids. The kids have umpteen activities. And yep. I just, you know, everybody, parents, both work full time. And many times in a small community like this, they're usually driving out of town to work. So I just don't know how it can be done. I know every so often I somebody calls or comes by for research and and I'm pulling things out for them and I look at them and I realize that they're they're not over 30 or 35 and I'm like you are young to be doing this. I love this. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Well those those young people as you just said in so many words, they're busy making history. When you retire and get older, you start thinking about, you know, reflecting on your life and history of the county and of the people you knew who have passed on, that kind of thing. But yeah, if you can keep it fresh for the young people and get them involved, if you find the the secret to that, let me know. Yeah, yeah, I probably have to let a lot of people know that want to know the answer to that. (laughs) Yeah. From, you know, everything that you've done, everything you've got going on, can you describe why you think the society is important to the community? And what makes your organization different or unique from other societies? Well, you know, it is, if you live in Fremont County, it's our, it's our beginning. You know, it's our history. You need to, everybody needs to know their history. And it has to be preserved. It must be preserved. You know, a couple of things that, that make our, our museum unique, our historical society, I think, as I mentioned before, because for one thing, part of our museum is a rodeo museum. Right. And also, and then as I mentioned too, I think that our genealogy library holding these original records that can be researched and can be photographed by our our visitors is just an amazing asset. I tell everybody when they come in the library with me, it this may not look as neat and organized as most, because you're not looking at you're not looking at indexes that are copied and put in binders neatly on the shelf you're looking at these great big old tax roll books you know you're you're looking at the probate files but this is the this is the original thing with your you know if your great grandfather was the executor of your great great grandfather's estate there's his signature you know what i mean you're you're looking at the real deal right there and i think it's just i think it's just amazing yeah it is just amazing so the rodeo is so important. And you know, with basketball or football or those kind of sports, you have sports personalities, let's say. And those sports personalities endorse products and, you know, they go places and visit. Do you have any of, of you know, rodeo personalities that are famous that could visit the museum? We, we have a lot of them, the now deceased, uh, the big you know, the big um, stars of rodeo. We have them, like, displayed in our museum. Oh, okay. I, I don't know of, you know, anything currently. Now, when we have the museum every year, the, of course, our, um, you know, some of our, our writers and the the rodeo clowns, you know, as I call them, you know, they, they always come in. So we we have our connections to the current participants in the rodeo. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know if you had them in like signing the wall or something. Hey, this is, you know, this is this famous rodeo star, you know, and they're visiting and, you know. Well, we do have a lot of that displayed, like I said, from people that had been there over the years, you know. Yeah. And in fact, back in the the glory days of the rodeo, back in the 60s, they would have a star every year. After we got in the 70s, that, you know, the cost of that, the cost was too prohibitive. They couldn't do that anymore. Yeah. But we have pictures of, of stars that they've had there over the years, you know, I mean, such as Michael Landon and, you know, and others that oh, were right. in these, you know, in the the Westerns in the 60s and everything, like like Doc and Festus were there. And it's, oh, wow. it's really just kind of neat to look up and see those pictures and you recognize, well, yeah, you know, Michael Landon, he's leaning on the fence that's behind the behind the entry gate to the rodeo, you know. So here he was right in Sydney, you know. Oh, that's fantastic. So if I'm contemplating, you know, I'm someone in another state and I'm I'm having genealogical research done or I'm somebody in the community and I'm contemplating joining the society, what are the benefits of that? Well, by becoming a member, paying the yearly membership, you 
you always have free admittance to the museum. You know, we do we do ask for a the, a small admission from the general public when they when they come in if they are not not a member. Right. And you know, and as far as the people that live what way with their memberships, they get connections and get the access for us to look up the kind of information that they're interested in on their family histories. Right. Okay. Do you have any member only things that people can access as members on the website versus non members? No, we, we really don't at this time. We've probably been using the same website for maybe eight years or so, so we probably we probably need to talk to our webmaster and and get kind of advance it and get it kind of more pattern to to what our needs are right now. Right. So I want to pick up again with the services that the society offers. So I know you do some genealogy research services, and I don't know how big, you know, of how many requests you get, that kind of thing, how much of a, a percentage of the work you do is research requests. But if you could talk about that for a minute, I would appreciate it. Yeah, our, our family genealogy research services, we, we are contacted on a regular basis by individuals whose ancestors had connections with Fremont County. Sometimes we're contacted through the, the website. There's a request form on the website. I will get an email. I oversee our email. And, and sometimes they, they call the historical society number. If we are not in the office, the, the phone number goes to my vice president's phone. Her name is Jan, and so she, when she gets a request, she passes my number on to them and have, have them call me right away. Another thing that makes our, our research or Fremont County special is that our, our museum has even been contacted by C.C. Moore. Now, she's probably a familiar name to most. She's a genetic genealogist, and she, the last two or three years, she's been very popular. She's been on... 2020. She's also through her DNA research. She has she has solved many cold cases. Wow! And by finding the killers, but she happened to have her her ancestors settled in Fremont County, Iowa. Oh, I knew you were going to say had, that. That's fantastic. And she has many that are many of her ancestors are buried right in the Sydney Cemetery. Wow. So, so we do have connections with somebody famous. Wow. C.C. Moore, that's fantastic. So have you met C.C.? No, I haven't. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to meet her in person. We have communicated by email, and I did find out she was in she was in Sydney a couple of years ago on oh. her way through to speak in Ames, and I wish that it was a Sunday, and she'd message me later and said she stopped by the museum, but nobody was there, and, and it was January, and I said, well, I wish you would have messaged me because I would have, yeah. I would have met you there. So, yeah. so that that was kind of unfortunate. Oh, that's so cool though. She's got ancestors buried there uh, in the local community. That's fantastic. Right. The um, the Travis family. Her her great great grandfather was Abraham Travis, and he was an earlier settler that came from Ohio, and then one of um, Abraham's daughters married a Proctor. So the Travis and Proctor families are her ancestors here and buried, you know, and, and the ones that didn't move on, move on out West are buried in the Sydney Cemetery. Wow. Okay, Cece, if you're listening and you're not already a member, please join the society. <laughs> <laughs> she, Cece, I, lots of time, about once a year, I, I send her a little request when we're doing a fundraise and she always donates to us. So oh, I, we really appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, I'm starting to wrap up the show here. Is there any other information or any message you'd like the community or your members to know about via this broadcast? Sean, nothing I can think of. I really think, I, I hope I didn't miss anything. I think I covered about everything I had on my list. Thank you for your time. Thank you uh, for spending the time with us today, Sandra. I have learned so much, had a great time, and I'm really glad to meet you. It's been a pleasure. It's inspiring, uh, really, how much you and your society do to help the community. And with that, we'll end our time with our guest, Sandra Bingston, the president of the Fremont County Historical Society. Listeners, please stay tuned for my comments and wrap-up, which is coming up next. Hello, boy.
Your support is a direct and vital investment in the programs that MicroStream Radio provides throughout the year. Whatever programs you enjoy remain alive and on the air thanks to contributions from generous donors like you. A contribution of any amount makes you a member. Please take a few moments and show your support today at www.patreon.com backslash microstream radio. Your support allows us to bring you more unique and increasingly valuable content. We thank you so much. If you're a historical or genealogical society listening to Preservation Oaks and you'd like to be a guest on the program, please email preservationoaks at gmail.com. Again, that's preservationoaks at gmail.com. Listeners, thank you for listening. You can comment anytime about the show or send suggestions by emailing preservationoaks at gmail.com. Thank you. And now, back to Preservation Oaks. All right, listeners, welcome to the wrap up. And we're back. Sometimes on the road of life, you come across people that are just plain good and intelligent. People who leave an indelible mark on you. Meet one Sandra Bengston of Sydney, Iowa, who fits that description to a T. I can think of no finer example of a person who is giving, selfless, kind, sharing, and wise. Someone for the youngsters of Fremont County to emulate and a great president of your society. Since 2014, when she started as the president of the Fremont County Historical Society, Sandra has had a challenging profession, but she has managed the society so that it's a major value add to the entire county. So let's recap our conversation. Sandra related some very exciting news for Sydney Iowans. The Sydney newspapers have now been digitized and are available for research. Now, Sandra might be able to figure out more precisely when the good people of Sydney started having their rodeo, which replaced the annual summer gathering of Civil War veterans once upon a time. That's very exciting, since the centennial anniversary of the rodeo is right around the corner in 2023. Congratulations to Sandra and team for rescuing several boxes of 150-year-old records from being destroyed by the county. People of Fremont County, please get to your elected officials and make sure no further record destruction occurs in the county without the oversight of the historical society and that all records go to them before being destroyed. This would have been a huge loss for you all. Sandra just happened to come across it and happened to work with the clerk to get four boxes of this material, these uh, original source documents saved. We discussed a huge project underway at this time, which is to prepare the county probate files for digitization. Sponsored by the Iowa State Historical Society, your historical society is digitizing all probate records from 1855 to 1951. The first step of this process is to take the old, old papers out of the old, old envelopes that they've rested in for a hundred years or more and unfold them so they can be scanned. Sounds easy, right? Nothing could be further from the truth. The papers are heavyweight and were folded with perhaps 20 to 25 other papers and put into the envelopes. Good luck to the society on getting this job done. There are over 3,000 of these to complete. Because of Sandra's background in law, she has an expert level understanding of the types of records held by county government. Therefore, the Genealogy Research Library holds original source records instead of just indexes. Visitors researching their family lineage have a treat in store for them when working with the society. Great news for those who haven't already heard it. Sandra was able to confirm that Ulysses S. Grant did stay in the Cromwell House when it was a hotel. Nice. Sandra believes he may have been there with other political luminaries of the time in an attempt to start the Greenback Party. The original hotel registry book and other items can be seen in an exhibit in the museum. 
We discuss the Underground Railroad that existed in the county during the time of the Civil War. Sandra relayed an interesting story about two slave girls who were owned by Stephen Knuckles. They ran away, and he was hot on their heels, with a gang of his own. The slave girls did manage to escape, and Stephen went on without them. During his search for them, he caused some damage to other people's property and was heavily fined. Sandra mentioned that the Tabor Historical Society has the most information about this event and also assisted the Fremont County Historical Society to present the information in the Civil War exhibit at the museum. Sandra relayed how the Jesse James Gang operated in Fremont County and gave the listeners a wonderful story of the James Gang robbing a bank in Imogene and then failing in an attempt to steal a fine team of local horses. We reviewed the work the Society does with school-aged children, providing them with an annual tour of the museum, a presentation on the old schoolhouse, and digital history files for their school teachers to help with their education. Some current goals of the Society for the coming year. Over the winter, Sandra would like to redesign the Society's website. It's been in use for eight years and deserves a revamp. The Society really needs to have a concrete parking area poured in front of the museum, and so they need donations to fund that. The Society would like to have a gazebo built near the museum to be used by the people of the county. Again, what is needed are donations to make that a reality. We discuss the facilities the Society manages, which are the museum, which was started in 2011 but took several years to finish because that's how long it took for sufficient donations to pay for it. The roof was also replaced in 2020. The Society was able to occupy the space in 2014. Then there's the old Sunnyside Schoolhouse, which was built in 1893 and saved by the Farm Bureau women. The Gathering Place, which was originally a Baptist church and was gifted to the Society in 1966. And the Farrell House Museum, which is a gorgeous 12-room museum filled with wonderful artifacts from the period. Sandra relayed how the Gathering Place is used for dinners, plays, and other events. People in the area can rent the space for their functions. If you're interested, please connect with the Historical Society. We chatted about how people can use Amazon Smile to make donations to the Society as they shop. Check it out. This makes it a lot simpler to consistently donate to the Society. We discussed some of the books available from the Society, such as the book entitled View from the Attic, which sounds like an excellent read and Thumbprints in Time, The History of Fremont County, which I'm going to get a copy of. Sandra mentioned that the book consists of collected reminiscences of the history of the county written by the elders at the time, as well as another book, Through the Country Town Cookbook, which also contains Sydney, Iowa history, written by Evelyn Birkby, who is sadly no longer with us. We discussed how members can get a Pioneer Family's Frame Certificate or a personalized brick from the Historical Society. Great way to honor someone uh, that has passed on or to honor your family legacy. We talked about how some of the streets of Sydney were named after landowners such as Webster and Fletcher. Next time you're driving on one of those streets, you'll know the history of the name. We talked about how and when the county began back in the 19th century and how the Historical Society began in 1963. Sandra and I discussed the beautiful booths located all over town as well as on light poles in the town of Sydney. These were painted by local art students and they really do brighten the town. We chatted about the Catholic Church in Imogene, which was built in 1915, replacing another one that stood on the same spot, which was built in 1880, but sadly burned down. The new church has an altar which was created in Italy, and it's really beautiful. If you're a listener in the area the Society serves, or if you're a listener researching ancestors in the community the Society serves, and you're not already a member, please consider joining and supporting the Society. I did challenge C.C. Moore 
uh, to join the society because she has a family in the area. I'd like to tell you the URL of the society. It is fremontcountyhistorical.org. The email is fremontcountyhistorical at gmail.com. And the phone number is 712-374-3248. I hope this information helps the audience understand how valuable this society is in the community and what kinds of excellent services they have to offer to their members and the public. This society is truly one of our preservation oaks, and you should be really proud of it. Okay, that's a wrap for this episode. Music used today is from Symbol Bird, Anthem of Rain, Tim McMorris, and timmcmorris.com. Microstream Radio is a registered trademark. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted by Microstream Radio. It cannot be commercially rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere for commercial purposes without the written permission of Microsteam Radio. Thanks to everyone for listening. This is Sean Thomas Radcliffe. See you all next time on Preservation Oaks.